Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across the demand so deep, he is single-handedly redeeming the internet with his content. That's right, friends, <laughs> the former Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man who is shifting the algorithm. <laughs> and that uh, that one was written as Garrett officially went viral uh, this past, was it, was it last week? Yeah, last week. Yeah, what is that? So Garrett put a reel out that was the first of the SEAL Big Four, and it was about uh, what? What is the first of the the Seal Big Four? G. Well, there's no specific order, but what that one was about was self talk. Right. So his reel on self talk, and I'm looking it up. I should have looked this up before we press record, but I want to do is at 1.4 million views, completely organic. So that was pretty fun, and a lot of new people are now I'm, aware of who Garrick and Uncle Buck is. I'm assuming you wrote that after I made the comment to you, and we were talking about it, that. You <laughs> know, I'm, exactly I'm glad right. that we had a, a reel do really well. That wasn't like yeah. a stupid TikTok type reel. Hundred percent. It's easy to get five million, you know, views on a reel of you know, use a viral, or use one of the viral audios, and then just do something you know, clickbaity and annoying, and that doesn't educate people at all. Yeah. So, so it was refreshing, and you know, I like to think that you are out there shifting the algorithm from hey, doesn't all have to be stupid. So well done, Garrett. That was a. Uh, Oh, well, thank you. This isn't like what our normal opener is. No, like, this but. is like an intro <laughs> intro with a point. I didn't. I don't know how to feel because normally I'm just waiting <laughs> I don't for know you to get, the, get the punchline. This is kind of weird. Let's thing. move on. Yeah. Anyways, okay. So today today's episode is about navigating the middle. I, I think um, naturally when I hear "Getting Stuck in the Middle," the song that I go to is "Stuck in the Middle with You." I, I can't remember. I always want to say it's Bob Dylan, but I know that's not who sings it. But like, it does sound like a Bob Dylan. It song. does, and even the singer sounds like it, but it's not him. And it is this thing of getting stuck in the middle. And we're going to get into this a little bit more uh, because the middle is really where people quit. We happen to be in the middle of uh, July when this releases. It'll be right at the beginning of July, which is the middle of the year. This is the middle of the year. So we're going to get into that more. But let's, G, you and I recently got back from something incredibly fun. That Actually, I didn't realize how long it had been a dream in your mind until someone said that you... Yeah, Joe, Joe Robinette re- reminded me because he was on the course and he said... You know, you told me about about this idea that you had eight years ago. Yeah. So we and did our is, Legacy Navigators course. Yeah, this is really something I've wanted to do for a long time. It was something, it was a part of SEAL training that I really enjoyed. Um, obviously, you enjoy the things you're good at. I was good at this part, so I really enjoyed it. But also, I saw so much outside value in it. Yeah. Uh, that's why I talk on it many times. I think it relates so much to life. And I saw it as a great, like, father-son course. I wanted to go. I've wanted to teach people land nav for a while. And and we had a lot of people. We've had a lot of people reach out about this. I would enjoy just teaching men land nav in general. Right. I would do that course a little bit differently as far as the structure. But I so loved getting to teach, you know, fathers and sons together and setting up the dads for a win with their son. And also having to work together and communicate. We saw, you know, all of those challenges and, and victories last yeah. week so or two I'll, weeks ago. Yeah, I'll give the I'll give the a little bit of a quick summary for those that didn't go on the course, which is pretty much everybody listening, although there will be some people listening that were like, I was there. So we had uh, eight fathers and nine sons out there with us, and we went to the Cleveland National Forest, which is where the Navy SEALs still to this day train uh, BUDS candidates in third phase land nav. And Garrett, basically, we went out there. First of all, we had a great house. If you want to see any of this stuff, it's all on our Instagram. You can see the house we stayed in. You can see a lot of the footage of what it looked like out there in the course and people like learning how to plot on their maps. But what was amazing about this, the needle in the haystack is the term that people use. And I want it like we basically took people who had no idea how to navigate. There was not one person there, I think, that had any clue about navigation from using a compass or really being skilled at that. And credit to you, G. I was very impressed with you. You took well, even people who are like, "Oh yeah, I know how to use Map and Compass." I'll say, "Okay, well, you know, give me an azimuth from this point to this point," and they're like, mm. "I don't speak Greek." Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's exactly the point. So Garrett took all these guys in a matter of two days, and then put them on day three. It was like, "Okay, I'm going to give you some coordinates." You're going to go ahead and plot them on a map, and then you're going to go out and find them. What they were looking for was like a wooden stake that we would pounded in the ground. So I want to imagine that somebody's dropped you into a place that's like 30 or 50 square miles and just said, hey, there's a stake out here. Here's the coordinates. Go find it. Like if that doesn't sound hard to you, you'd have no idea. It's easy to find, you know, the spotlights in the distance or, right. you know, a mountaintop or a waterfall, very prominent features Yes, that you just, you know, really just have to navigate your path to them. But you can see you have a beacon, essentially a lighthouse. Right. It's very different when you don't know you're at the right point until you finally get to this little thing on the ground. Yeah. And, and what was so interesting about You've this? You've got to get within 15 meters of it 
to see it. Right. And I, and I even, with one of the groups who had a point that they couldn't find, I went back with them and showed them where it was. And they're like, oh my gosh, we walked right past this like three times. Yes. So, so this was physically demanding because yeah. it, you're hiking miles, you're having to go uphill, you're dealing with like brush. There was these things called tagalongs or spears or a number of different things. Basically Stickers, things that, wherever, yeah, you know, different parts of the country call them called different, different things. things that basically jump onto your socks and poke you in, in your feet which make it very uncomfortable. There was flies that were nonstop. And here's the thing. They weren't mosquitoes biting you. They were just flies that would buzz around your head. Like literally when we set the stakes out there, I hiked for I think six and a half hours and there was not one second where I didn't have a fly flying around my head. It was like it was great mental training because I was just like, well, guess they're gonna be there. Yeah. But uh, it, <laughs> if you keep if you keep moving, they don't bother you so much. Yeah. Or if you just stay focused on your task, you can you can drown out the that's going around your head the whole time. But what was amazing? So we say Garrett, Garrett trained these guys. Garrett trained the sons. He did not train the fathers. So what was fascinating? They to were me, invited to to learn and watch, but yeah, I wasn't in giving the instruction to right. that. So what was so fascinating for me was you have now these fathers and sons that on this last day, it's like, hey, you're going to go find these po- these points, and it's like if you're the father, there's no like, oh well, I'll just do it, whatever. I'm, we're just going to fast forward through this part because if you don't know how to use a map and compass and you haven't learned in the past two days, you now have to coach your son, be like, hey, are you sure well, about this? I think this? there were like, some dads who like thought they knew right but they hadn't that they hadn't taken the test the way that i tested the young guys right. there's just like oh yeah i get it you've got to more than get it when it comes to because on a map you put a pencil mark down for a point an inch away from where you thought you had plotted it from and that's over 100 meters right, right. so you can't like very you can't like kind of do it and if you navigate to your point and it's 100 meters from where you think the stake is on if you're lucky it'll take you an hour to find the point You've got to get to yeah. the to the really right area, and then it'll take you five minutes or less to find your point. So, and I will say, it was amazing to watch all these guys, the memories, the bonding. Like, I, I'm proud. I'm proud of you because I thought you did a great job of teaching. But I'm proud oh, of the trip you. because I think all the like the all the men just had. I think it was what they expected, and way more in the sense of the bond I'll, I'll tell you that was I'm, created. What I'm proud of, and then we'll, we'll move on. What was really valuable to me about the trip, one of our uh, values at The Impossible Life is the value of greatness. Yes. And the way some people would describe this is like some, you know, being magical or have like a special Mm -hmm. quality. And for us at The Impossible Life, like greatness really is just this like specialness, especially that we want to have around our events and experiences that we give people. And I really feel like we lived up to that. I feel like people came and it was, uh, it, it, for a lot of people, it exceeded their expectations. Um, there were little pieces of the event that they didn't know, and you could see our level of preparation for it. So I, I, I was really happy about that part. Yeah, me too. We created a specific experience at the end that I uh, was complete surprise to them, but had that real like, oh wow, I, th- this is amazing, and that's that's what we aim for every time. So the reason we're talking about legacy navigators is because this is a great example of being able to quit in the middle because. Garrett does not ever give people an easy time, including myself. And the reason he does that, I, I, hey, I, we said in the advertisement, <laughs> I mean, it, this is the same training that yeah. seals go through, and I gave them the seal training minus like you the beat know, downs. minus all the beatdowns. Yeah, and you weren't verbally abusive, so well yeah. done, proud of you. But so what this meant is that on the last day, it was like, hey, your phones are going to go in this bag that's got a serialized zip tie on it, which means if you open it, yeah, you will know. Around. Well, one, I I I taught them how to use. I taught all the dads how to use. Uh, navigation on their phone right even if you if you don't know this about your phone just a little uh education for you your phone has a gps in it as well and so gps signal is different than cell signal gps signal comes from satellites Mm -hmm. and so even if you have you know you're in the middle of the forest you have no cell service if you've downloaded offline maps so you have the base data Mm -hmm. of where you are um because if you don't have the offline data your phone will still know where you're at on an index, but for most of these maps, it's just like a gray background. So it gives you no <laughs> yeah. information. But if you download, which it correlates to just like a, a, a pixel latitude, longitude. But anyways, if you've downloaded the underlying data, right, the map data, even when you have no cell service, you can navigate using a map and compass. And I, I showed them a, an app that we use in the military, which uh, works with like, it, it uses the same tools that I teach throughout the course. So it's really easy to take what we've learned, look at the phone and know exactly where you are, how to navigate to points, uh, all of that good stuff. I showed them how to use that because I needed them to have, uh, you know, kind of a safety insurance policy. If you do get lost, yeah. right, use your phone so you can get home. Don't actually get lost. Yeah, because this was a large area and a lot of people didn't have cell service. So, so. They, had, they had a digital GPS. I right. mean, they, they're not going to get lost if, as long as their phone didn't die. Um, I say that to say, big if. 
but then for test day, I was like, hey, so here's the deal. Um, you can go through this course and use your phone if you feel like you need it because we did a practice test the day before. You can use a phone if you feel like you need it and you're still going to complete the course and have a good time and have a feeling of accomplishment. It's still a lot of work just to navigate mm -hmm. to the points using your phone. But I said, if you want to be certified as a navigator or an expert navigator, which I printed them certificates, it was very nice. I said, if you want to pa if you want to really pass this course, you can't use your phone. So I put their phones in, you know, a, a security bag with a serialized zip tie. And it's like, hey, test day. Uh, if you get back and you've broken the seal on your bag, I'm not going to certify you. Right. And so, and on top of that, so in order to be expert, you had to find all six of your points and you had a limited time. Everybody started at 8 a.m. and they had until 4.30, just to give you an idea of the amount of miles that they were covering and the difficulty involved. Six points, you have eight and a half hours. And you, if you got four of the six, you could still be a certified navigator if you got, but you had to get all six to be expert. Right. So the reason, that's why we wanted to share this because this is such a great picture of life because we know that we talked to certain men, they're like, man, we were looking for our first point for two and a half hours. Now, if you know you're on a time crunch and you know you've got a lot of distance to travel and you can't find one, at what point do you kind of quit on that one and go, hey, I guess it's just not going to work out? And like, I'm going to go to the next point. Easy when you have a very set, you are trying to do this. This is your set amount of time. But that's not how life works. In life, it's like, man, I thought I was going to go do this. And we have these blueprints in our mind. And this is a Tony Robbins thing. You know, I haven't done this in a while. Tony Robbins, he, he says... Uh, he says that if everybody in their mind has a blueprint and if you're ahead of like, they don't know it, but they have a blueprint right. for their life. And when you're ahead of your blueprint, you're happy. And when you're behind your blueprint, you're miserable. And this is, this is the kid. This is the 25 year old who feels like they should be a tech giant. And they're like, man, I just thought my career would be further along. And they're kicking themselves and they're beating themselves up because they had this blueprint. Well, you know, that's how it happens in life on this legacy navigators course, it was very much like scripted for them and they had to make decisions. So to that point, just to say before, because we are going to move on and get into to how to navigate the middle. But if you are, if you've heard us talk about legacy navigators, you're a father that has a son between the ages of 10 and 20. We are, we're going to put a link in the show notes if you want to get more information on next year's trip, because there's a limited number of spaces uh, available. We've already had pe plenty of people express interest after seeing this year's trip. I will tell you, you will never stop talking about this trip. It was, um, it was impactful, and honestly, it was just a lot of fun uh, on top of being very, very uh, valuable as far as the lessons learned. So we'll put the link to that in the show notes. But so going back to that po point I was saying about just how do you know what you're doing, right? Like if you're stuck in life, if you're stuck in what you're doing, I mean, how's your year going? If you're sat there listening to this, that's a great that's a great way to think about this. We're in July. At the beginning of the year, just oh, like all of these New guys, Year's res. at yeah. the beginning of the day, they set out with a plan. Hey, I'm yep. going to be, I'm going to get to this point right. by this time. I'm going to get to this point by this time. Um, we all, you know, had a plan at the beginning of the year of what you thought your year would look like. We're halfway through the year. It's a good time to check in and say, am I where I thought I would be? Right. Are things going the way that I thought they would be, be going? And if they are, great. Continue doing what you originally right. planned at the beginning of the, the year. If anything's not on course or where you wanted it, this is a good time to sit down, have, do a quick mental break. You know, in the middle of a, a land nav day, you take 15 minutes and you need to reassess. Yeah. We're not where we're supposed to be. What do we need to do now? This is a, we're just saying this as a reminder. It's the middle of the year. Take some time to reassess and say, am mm -hmm. I where I thought I am? If I'm not where I want it to be, what do I need to do to change that? What do I need to adjust? Yeah, because one of the biggest things that could, will throw you off, you know, living your life with purpose is just getting distracted. And right now there's a million distractions. It's summertime. There's all sorts of different sports going. If you're a parent, your kids are off school. You know, there, there's like, oh, there's vacations. Hey, let's go to the pool. Let's, I mean, there's so many different things that this three-month period of summer could fly it's by. It's easy to be distracted. Yeah, and you're like, oh, man, that, that quarter just flew by and I did nothing. And you you don't even realize how far off track you are. So the, the middle, like we said, is where people quit and we're in the middle of the year. Um, the reason is because you're far from the start and you're far from the finish. Like think about this. If you've ever run any sort of marathon or half marathon or anything, at the beginning of the race, everybody's like, you know, they got the music. There's people cheering you. The photographers are there. There's usually some race DJ that's like hyping everybody up. And you set off that first mile and you're like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm PRing on this mile, right? No one is sitting there at mile 14 going like, yeah, come on, like giving you the huge pump up because you still got 12 more miles to go. Yeah. Like you're in the middle of the race. It is the ugliest part because you're so far from the end. There's, like, Even if someone could pump you up, it wouldn't really do you much good because you still have so much to go for. And this is pump you up for another half mile and then you're <laughs> yeah, right back to you're where like, you were. Dang it. Now I got 11 and a half miles. Exactly the point. So like what is that in life? We, we touched on Motiv it a little motivation bit. Motivation doesn't make your blisters go away. No, uh, it certainly doesn't. It also doesn't hydrate you. <laughs> or, or give you nutrition. 
But we talked about so so where where you people quit is is like in the year. Like we talked about right now, there's a lot of people who had some lofty plans that if they haven't already quit by the average, which is February seventh, then they're they're sitting there going, you know what? May this year just wasn't what I thought it was. It wasn't be. meant to be. Yeah, you know, I just I got it all wrong. And they're literally not only are they just like they're not course correcting, they're just stopping the course completely, which is crazy. But people do this in their plan all the time, whether it's they want to get in shape or they want to reform their finances or whatever they're trying to accomplish. You start going, you have lots of gusto, and then you burn out, right? That's what people say, like, ah, oh, I just, you know, I just, it just sort of fizzled out. I need to take a break. Yeah, I need to take a break. It wasn't, it wasn't going the way I thought. I wasn't really seeing the results that I wanted. Like, insert whatever reason is. That's when you stop. It's in your job. How many people start a new job and they're so pumped to start this job? They're excited. They're thinking about all the things that's going to make it better than the previous job they had. Until it's not what you thought. Exactly. And then what happens? Oh, man. They start losing their energy about it. Maybe it's time to look for another one. This happens in relationships as well, whether it's romantic or friends. Like when you first meet that new person, whether it's a friend or romance, man, you're so excited to hang out with them. Oh, like all the all the possibility, the excitement. And then as you go on, you just start taking things for granted or mm-hmm. you start noticing things you didn't like or whatever happens and you burn and you literally you just stop because you're you're getting lost in the middle. That is the this is if that's you, if you ever if you're the type of person that starts things and you don't finish them, we put this episode together for you fair g absolutely good so this is about follow through get not getting stuck in the middle exactly and because we were fresh off of a, a navigation course i felt like this is a good time to do it now one of the things that you taught and we're not this is not going to be a how-to maps course because if you didn't take the course there's a lot of things we could talk about that would make perfect sense to garrett and i that would make no sense to you but you garrett has this special thing that he says he never feels lost which I feel like is partially him rubbing it in my face and also partially true. Um, but the, the thing, the reason you never feel lost is you said you need known references. Yeah, right? I would tell you I don't feel lost because it's it's really a combination of two things. It's awareness, but also the ability to take that awareness that you have, see, gather information, see certain things, and use those as reference points, right. as known points. Right. Because one of the exercises we did with the guys out in the course on day two where they were, uh, or sorry, at the end of day one, where they were really um, starting to learn how to use their map and compass to understand where they were, is I would walk guys around the forest right. and I would just stop at a random spot and say it wasn't totally random. I was stopping at intentional places for a reason where they would have reference points. But I'd say, show me exactly where we are on the mm-hmm. map, right? Not like the general area. Show me exactly where we are on the map. And I wanted them to gather information that was, mm-hmm. if they'd been paying attention from where we were at the last point, because where we, you know, we started, uh, when we started the hike that day, I was like, here's where we are right now on the map. Yeah. Then I walked to the next place and I said, where are we? And I told him, you know, hey, what I want you to be doing as we're walking is use your compass, understand the direction that we're going, uh, have a, and try to have an, uh, uh, at least an estimate of how far we've walked. Yeah. And then you're going to use the information around you. What can I see? What, what, rela- what can I see with my eyes that relates to what's on the map that helps me understand where I'm at and how this works in, you know, a, uh, literal to figurative or natural to supernatural, uh, understanding for my life is I've got to have an awareness, right? I've got to be awake as I'm walking through life. And what other information do I have instead of just like, you know, walking the path that I thought I would go on? Maybe the path doesn't go the way you thought it would go. And what other information do you have in your life that gives you data, that gives you feedback, that you're along the right path or you're not along the right path? Yeah, that's so good. You you said something when I was out there. And like I said, I feel like I have a pretty good highlighter when you say things that I'm like, okay, there's something more to that. And you, you told the guys so clearly, like, there is information all around you. You need to be taking it in. That's what you said. And mm-hmm. I remember I was like, man, that is such a metaphor for life. Great scripture because you're talking about awareness. And also the, I would say awareness and prudence go hand in hand. Uh, Proverbs 14, 8, it says, the prudent understand where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. Yeah. And so, like, so much of this of taking in the information around you is just being aware of, like, okay, what's changing? Like, we talked, I mean, I, I gave a few like, things. Just like... For example, it's halfway through the year, right? right? And so this is a good inventory point to stop. Maybe you haven't been aware, right? And so you stop now and you start looking like, oh, well, I said I wanted to lose 50 pounds this year. Um, I've only lost five. You shouldn't be just occurring to you now. But if you you haven't been really paying attention along the way, this is going to be kind of a wake up call Mm -hmm. for you, right? The point if uh, if you were on a gradual path, you know, and you're losing 50 pounds throughout the year, you should have lost more than 25 pounds by the middle of the year because it's going to get harder towards the end of the year. 
I say that to say, if you're paying attention all along the way, instead of halfway through the journey, a quarter way through right. the journey, or at you know small intervals throughout the journey, you're going to understand I'm, I'm on track versus I'm off track. Right. It, yeah, exactly. Or you're going to also understand you know, some of the things that sometimes I think you can make conclusions that you're off track when you're really not because you're unaware of some things that are changing your environment. I talked about, hey, if you're a parent with kids, your kids are off school. Is that going to affect your life? Yeah. Is that going to maybe bleed over into some of the goals that you have? If your fitness routine was I wake up and I work out an hour after I drop off the kids, like I'm being really obvious here. Yes, that is going to have a massive impact on you. You need to see these things coming. That's why we're so big on like time management and looking ahead on your schedule. But there's, that's just a very, very simple example. There's lots of different things around uh, our routines, the way that we handle ourselves, the people that come into our lives that are going to affect uh, the are going to impact our life and, and can make us feel like we're either off course or on course or distract us. And this is part of taking in the information of life. Um, one of the things I, I want to say, we're going to give you guys three keys to really having follow through here. That's, that's where we're headed right now. But it, to the awareness issue, we talked about how people quit in the middle. Here's a, here's a point of awareness for you. Quitting and highlighted by our Mount Massive, uh, our Mount Massive hike, which Quit. I'm looking forward to round two. I am too. We're going to complete it this year and not run out of time, and also not get uh, way <laughs> way fared by a blizzard. But but quitting isn't as easy as you think, right? Like that was one of the things that made me laugh when we were hiking this mountain. Like you think if you quit on a sometimes uh, quitting's easy, but yeah, other yeah, times but, you're in a position where I I, I love that on the mountain because I could tell some guys were at the point where they want to quit. It's like if you did quit, you still have to walk five hours back down the mountain. <laughs> exactly. You can quit. And you can tell yourself I quit, but it doesn't and, sign and you have to your do it on your own. Yeah. But you know what? I would I would put that in like that's the same as quitting on like your plan or your relationship. Like you don't just unravel a relationship with a text. Well, it's it's a, a thought that I had and have taught to uh, many of the tadpoles that I've worked right. with about understanding the point of no return. Right. The point of quitting, right? It, the, like the only right time to quit is before you start. Right. That's exactly right. right. You need to understand what you're submitting to, understand what you're going through before you really get into that journey. Yeah. It's like you don't, you know, if you're swimming across the lake and it's a mile and a half, you know, across the lake, you don't quit in the middle. Right. Right. And yeah. the, you're in the middle of the lake. It's like you can quit, but um, you still have to swim back. And yeah. it's just as far to go back home as it is to get to the other side from here. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's an easy analogy. But like what you were saying about uh, what we were saying about this in regards to relationships or plans, like you when you quit, like you are giving yourself an experience that you now have to make sense of because are you a quitter, right? Like it's not as simple as just being like, oh, well, that didn't work out. Like you're developing different habits. You're developing different schools of thought in your subconscious mm -hmm. and you're, you're going to have to work out some of this stuff. It's not as simple as like, you know, oh, I quit in the middle of a marathon and then a golf cart came and took me back, <laughs> right? Like it's not, that's not how Doesn't life works. Doesn't work that way. No, exactly. So we want to keep you from quitting. We want you to be the type that can endure through the middle. So here's the three keys to follow through, G. And number one, you have a lot to say about all these, is long suffering. Yeah, so long suffering is actually one of the fruit of the spirit. There you go. Which not one of the fruit of the spirit that people think about very no, often. I love love, joy and peace, bro. Bring me bring me all of those. Right, because long suffering is also in many translations, it's patience. Yeah. But that's really like the actual definition of uh, of what this word is. It's the Greek word macrothemia, which means there's not a direct English translation for it. But if you were going to translate it to an English phrase, macrothemia would really mean long-tempered. Right. Right, where you say someone is short-tempered, right? We, we have yeah, a term for a term. that. Yeah. We don't have a term for long-tempered, but that's most directly what macrothemia means. Right. The, the way that the Greek word that's used for it in, in, the, in the scriptures for fruit of the spirit. And that's why other translations call it long-suffering because it's the ability to just stay with it. Mm -hmm. Right, it's more than endurance. It's just like saying, like, man, this this hurts. This is painful, and I need to just hold it in. I need to just stay with it. Right, short tempered people, it gets it gets difficult, and they explode. Right, long tempered people, um, people who are patient, it gets difficult, and they say it's okay. Maybe just time is all that's needed. Hmm. If I'll just wait a little bit longer, we'll get through it. Yeah, and like, if you think about it, this, maybe revelation for you, Nick, or maybe you've thought about it before. But in all the stories of people that we've talked to around the quitting and the 100-mile race, mm -hmm. what's a part of their equation and their quitting is not that they say, I couldn't complete this. They say it would take too long. Right. That's, well, that's exactly, yeah, and my own story as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's right. long-suffering, really. It's patience, really, just this ability that, like, I'm in the middle of a difficult situation, 
and I'm not going to get out of it shortly. Yeah. Right. It's okay. I'm just, I just need to stay here and stay with it. And if you'll have this ability, whatever journey you're going on, you're going to come to a time where you're like, man, it's sucked for a long time and it's not going to get easier anytime soon. And if you'll have the ability to say, that's okay, I can stay with it, right? To understand like, I don't need to, yeah. where people quit is they say, what's the soonest I can make this mm-hmm. go away? Yeah. How can I get out of this as soon as possible? I want to abandon chip. I want to make the pain go away. When you start thinking that way, you're on your way to quitting. Mm. But long suffering or having a long tempered mindset is even when you're in the middle of a difficult situation, you're saying, it's okay, I can just stay here. I can stay longer. Yeah. You said, I mean, one of the fr- things you said to guys, all the guys on the course, before we did anything, literally it was like before we had done any training, you said the number one thing you need to have is a positive attitude. Yeah. And you talk about I, at that. At the very beginning of the course, I yeah. laid out my rules. Number yeah. one rule, positive attitude. Right. And the reason you, you say that, though, I mean, you want to develop long suffering, be the type of person that always has a positive attitude. Because you've said it before, once you get negative, once you start complaining, you're, you're on the path to quitting. I can tell you, if you have a negative attitude in land nav, like you'll get lost and super pissed off. Yeah. You'll like wander into a thick, uh, like a thicket or thick bush and just like, why am I here? This is the stupidest thing ever. And and I'm, I'm speaking from experience because I did this. <laughs> uh, when I was going through land nav on my practice test day, I was, wasn't feeling sorry for myself, but I wasn't doing well. Right. I was dehydrated. I was frustrated, and I got into this thick bush. And I was like, whatever. This is stupid. I'm just going to push through it, right? And I kind of lost my awareness, right, because I was so frustrated and so upset with the moment. I was hot and just tired, just all of that. And so I started pushing through this thicket that honestly, like, it takes minutes to go feet, right? That's how right. thick the bush is. Like you're fighting it, and there are times where like your feet are off the ground, like trying to get through this no bush. Way. Like is that <laughs> thick? And I pushed into this thing for like 30 minutes, just saying like, whatever, I'll just get to the other side. And it was foolishness, right? I it was like I had a moment uh, where I stopped because I was so frustrated and like out of breath and mad. And I thought of like what my dad had said to me when I was a little kid. Wish you had a, I wish I could film you so you could see yourself right now. Hmm. And I thought of like I I caught myself i was aware and was like man i look like an idiot right now and i didn't know i I got so far into the bush i had no idea where i was right it's just a big thick bush i mean it could have been 100 yards could have been 400 yards there's some big thickets Mm -hmm. out there and so i had to humble myself and you could i just had to go right back the way i came which is very easy to see it the bush was (laughs) so thick it just looked like a bear you know went through there and spread all the bushes apart i could just follow my path out it was very painful and frustrating. I was like, my leg is bleeding as I'm trying to climb out of this thicket. Um, but I said all that to say, when you get when you don't have the long suffering, right? That's what quitting would look like sometimes. Right. Like yeah. I wasn't quitting, but I was almost quitting. I w- I was abandoning the yeah. the tools that I had to solve a problem. Right. And just saying whatever, I'm just gonna you know just mm-hmm. push through it. I wasn't using all of my senses. That's so good. So so it's not quitting in the sense that you down tools, but it's quitting and being who you know you should be. Exactly. And operating the way you should. And a lot of people quit that way. Like they don't they don't get off the racetrack. Yeah. uh, but they stop racing the way they know they're supposed to. That's so good, man. One of the things that you said, and then I want to move on to point two. So we talked about how when you go negative, that's the beginning to quitting. But but what people often don't associate as a negative thing is anger. Right, a lot of people are okay with well, walking around angry all the time. I like the way Gary V says it. Um, he says it about quitting corporately, but I think it's very like this relates to the type of quitting uh, that we're talking about. He says people who quit aren't the worst people for your company. No, the people who quit and leave. He said the real dangerous people in your company are the people who quit and stay. Yeah, right. And I've seen people do that in all types of places. You can quit and stay in your job. You can quit and stay in your marriage. You can quit and stay in your life. You don't necessarily want the consequences right. of just completely walking away. There's also some cowardice in you that you say like, well, I, I don't want to be here, but I don't want to go through the conflict of leaving. Right. Uh, but you're a penalty on yourself and everyone around you because you're not being who you're supposed to be. Hmm. And my penalty, you know, in that moment was out of my frustration and not using my senses. I got to just, you know, fight the forest for an hour. Right. I really hope that that's, you know, you, you, you spawn something I heard. I was talking to a friend of mine recently who's, who's gone through divorce and he was talking about since he's gone through divorce, how many other men have reached out and said that they're right on the verge of it and they want it, but they don't want to do it because of the kids or the house or whatever. And I mean, when he said that to me, I was kind of shocked, but like, that's what you just said is, is the quit and stay. And it's like, if that's you, I hope that this is a wake-up well, call. It's one of the pieces. It's, it's not the whole picture, but long-suffering is one of those pieces. Say like, you know what? My marriage isn't fun right now. 
but I'm going to fix it. That's right? right. And I need to stay here in it. I'm, I don't need to abandon it. I don't right. need to lose my senses, but I'm going to get through it. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to help it be better. And you know what? Eventually, I'll get on the other side of this. Yeah. And your frustration and your anger and your negativity don't help it get better. I'm at mile 67, and I'm a long way from the finish line, and it's going to take a long time. But I just need to keep going forward. When I get to mile 80, I'll feel differently. Yeah. When I get to mile 90, I'll feel differently. That's exactly right. That's the 100-mile reference there. Okay. Point number two, G, is eternal focus. It, well, it's eternal perspective. Perspective. Shoot. Right. I, Which, put the, I put the wrong okay. word on our board. Um, eternal perspective. Like perspective is your view on things. That's what a perspective is. It's the way you see things. It's the way you frame something. Right? The... Um, the uh, famous question of is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? That's a question of perspective. The question is, what do you see? Mm. Right? Like the, the glass doesn't change, but what do you see when you look at it? That's what a perspective is. And so what we're talking about is an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective is a when you look at your life, when you look at the situations that you're going through, what frame do you look at it mm. in? Um, like the worst frame that you can look at life in is like, well, how fun is this for me? Right. How much, what am I going to get out of it? Those yeah. are the worst perspectives to have. They'll, they'll frame everything incorrectly. Right. So that's a short term perspective. Anyone who's ever lied or stolen, right. Which is every single one of us on this podcast. It doesn't matter how perfect you think you are. You've lied at some point in your life or stolen something in your life. And anytime you've done one of those things, we all, we all inherently know it's wrong. Right. Like no one really yeah. needs to like help you with like, oh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that. You know, I said, I didn't tell the truth. Um, we all inherently understand that and have different levels based upon our moral integrity, have different levels of like check uh, before we step over one of those lines. But anytime you've ever lied or stolen, you had a short term perspective. You're saying if I lie or steal, I can get past, I can potentially shortcut or route around what would be painful for me, mm -hmm. right? People lie out of just, I don't want to have to tell the truth. It'd be painful for me, painful for them, painful for both of us. I don't want to have to deal with reality. Whenever you've done one of those things, you are making a short-term decision saying, I hope this would, this will help me feel better in the moment. And I hope it never catches up to me, right? right. People are much more likely to lie and steal if they think they could never get caught, Right. Getting caught just means dealing with the consequences. Right. And so I'm, I'm using this as an example of perspective. That's a short term perspective. It's so easy for us to have a short term perspective. You quit when you have a short term perspective. I can't tell. It's an, it's a, it's sad, frustrating, unfortunate. The amount of like young men that I've spoken with who their dream is to be a Navy SEAL. They think about it all the time. They talk about it all the time. But then they got into a place where it's tough and they said, you know, I just don't think I wanted that anymore. Mm. Right. And they, they were they were lacking in the long suffering quality of, hey, I'm just going to get on the other side of this. Then I'll feel differently. The, the what pairs well with this is eternal perspective right. and saying, you know, the thing isn't about the thing. I got to zoom out and look at this through a different lens. The same way when I'm navigating on the map, I'm not just looking at like the 10 trees around me and waiting for one of them to speak to me. Right. I'm looking like what have I seen in the last few hundred meters? When you look at a map that's in one to twenty five thousand scale, it doesn't show individual trees on there. Right. It shows ridge lines. It shows valleys. It shows creeks. Right. So you got to look for some of the more prominent things. And then the same thing with an eternal perspective. You go through like these little issues and small areas in your life and you don't get off track by that. Right. If I start to just walk through like a thick patch of trees, I'm not just going to like quit and give up. Yeah. I have a much bigger frame of reference that I'm looking towards a long, a, a target longer out and I can keep walking in that direction. One of the exercises I didn't teach and you weren't there for this, Nick, but I showed to some of the young men when I was working with them in an individual perspective. I, like we would, uh, we'd be trying to navigate towards a point, and one of the things we're looking at all the time is our compass. We're following the compass needle, and we are going to count our steps. And if you're just looking down, it's really easy to like end up in a weird piece of ground. It's like you'll walk through cactus or you'll walk through like a, a creek bed or whatever. You'll end up in like kind of a funky place mm -hmm. if you're just looking down. You have a short lens. And what I would do with some of them, I'd say, okay, the compass is pointing, you know, this way directly in front of us. And we want to go how far? 300 meters, 400 meters. Do you see something out there in front of us that's at that direction 300, 400 meters away? Yeah. Just look at that and walk that way. Mm. It's much easier than trying to like look down at right. the ground. You end up like stepping over all these logs. It's like, hey, look at where you want to go that's much mm. further out. Now you can navigate a little bit easier yeah. instead of like I'm so focused on looking down and, and trying to, you know, take in this one piece of information. 
I end up in some difficult situations. And so I say all this to say eternal perspective is this really long time frame lens for your life uh, that actually, if, if you want to live a great life, don't live for next year, don't live for five years from now, live for 50 years from now. And if you want to have an even greater life than that, live for a perspective that actually goes beyond your time here on earth, mm-hmm. right? I'm not living um, my life towards the end of my life. I'm living my life towards the finish line being in eternity. And that allows me to make different types of decisions. Yeah, it's really it really is a matter of what you're focusing on. Like if you want to make this really simple, it's like, what are you focusing on? Because I think when people get stuck, the, the way Paul describes it multiple times in the New Testament, and he says these short uh, and momentary circumstances. Yeah. And Paul, when Paul says that he's talking about being on death row, mm-hmm. right? Like, ah, it's no big deal. Right. Right. Because he's looking at life in a different perspective and yeah. a different lens. Like, hey, it's really difficult right now. People are mad at me. Somebody wants to execute me. Uh, the last town I was in just stoned me. These are short and momentary difficulties. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you're in those, it, I mean, those are, those seem like real problems for us. But when you, if you look at like what it feels like to get lost in the middle and get stuck, your focus usually is entirely on a problem to the mm-hmm. point that, like, you know, we all know if you put something really close to your face, I just put my fit my hand over my eyes. I can't see anything other than my hand. So my whole world is that hand. Whereas if you pull that hand out, well, now I see all these other things around me and it really is a matter of what you're focusing on. All right. So point three G, and this is a, uh, a wonderful point is rely on God, right? Yeah. So we've, we, these are three keys to follow through, mm-hmm. right? And number one is long suffering. It's patience, long tempered ability, right? You've got to have that. Yeah. Meaning sometimes the only thing you're going to have to do to get through this is just suck it up. Right. Right. And if you don't have that, you're going to quit on a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, second thing that's going to help you really get through the middle is a long time frame lens. Zoom out, look at your situation in a different context. Is the way I like to say it is if you zoom in, you'll see more pain. If you zoom out, you'll see more purpose. Right. Very right. Good. You need to have the ability to zoom in and zoom out for different reasons. Uh, but when you're in a, a place of feeling too much pain and feeling like quitting, you need to be able to zoom out. Um, and the greatest perspective that you can have, the longest time frame lens you can have is an eternal perspective. The third thing that's going to help you have follow through in your life is to rely on God. This is the under, like we're all uh, looking for in our lives, like where we can have more control, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what's going to help us feel certainty because that's what we want so much. We want deep certainty in yeah, our life, seriously. right? And that if if you are following God with your life, that's not, he's He's not said, I've, I've called you to a life of certainty. For sure. He said, I've called you to a life of following me and trusting in me. Um, when Jesus spoke to all the disciples, all the disciples, and he said, follow me, there were no qualifying questions. Mm. How, how long do we have to follow right. you? Will I get paid for following you? Right. And there, there were times where people asked questions of Jesus uh, and related to following him. And they were always very difficult, challenging answers mm-hmm. in, in the way that he responds. And so for us to fo- have great follow through in our life, this builds upon long suffering and eternal perspective. But if we'll rely on God and just say, God, you know what? I'm going to trust in you in this. I don't see necessarily how this is supposed to work out for good, but I followed you here, right? And I'm going to keep following you still, even though now it, it might be difficult for me, even though now it might might not make sense for me. I'm not going to give up what I know is true in the middle of a difficult circumstance. Mm, very good. And one of the scriptures that I, I love uh, in relation to this context is Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, verse. it starts at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Right. So that's about the man who trusts in flesh, yeah. who trusts in himself. Right. Because then it's, it's James, the brother of Jesus, who says, who are you to say that I'm going to go here tomorrow and right. do this, yeah. right? Your life is but a vapor. And the truth is, as much confidence as we have in our own strength, our ability to fully control things is so oh, small. So minuscule, yeah. So here's the other side of that. But it said, cursed is the man who trusts in flesh. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. I love that. So it's it's understanding, you know, what my strength isn't isn't me. If your strength is you, you're the type of people. You know, I, I I talk about this. It's 
in relation to peace. Peace doesn't come from um, knowing what will happen. Peace comes from knowing what you'll do. That's a Garrett Uncle Buck quote, <laughs> quoting himself. And if if you're the type of person that's trusting in yourself, that's you so want like, well, if, if I can do this and I can do this and I can do this, then, then I'll get this. For and, sure. and it's this deep desire for mm-hmm. certainty. And, and it's logical and it's reasonable for us to want some of that. But in following God, he tests us in saying, will you step outside of reason? And this is, that's the test of faith. Yeah. Faith often defies reason. And so in following God, we've got to learn to trust in him um, or we're going to be, you'll only be as strong as what you're capable of. And this is an understanding that God's ways are better. God's ways are higher. He's the one that has a plan for me. He created the plan for me. Uh, like he said to Job, where were you yeah. when I learned what laid the earth's foundations? Oh, you don't like the way I'm doing things right now? You don't know anything. Yeah. Right. And so when you actually have fear of the Lord and humility in front of the Lord, that's when you'll be willing to trust him in the middle of your difficult circumstance. Mm-hmm. And it also it really just creates so much peace in your life. Yeah. That when you're you're like in these really difficult middles Big and time. say, you know what? God, I'm accountable to you before I'm accountable to anyone else. And so what does your word say? What do I need to do that honors you? And that's at, again, these build on each other. Rely on God builds on eternal perspective. If I'm living my life and saying not, you know, what would give me the most fame and respect in my lifetime. Yeah. If I'm living my life and saying, what would, how could I live my life today that honors the Lord? And when you trust in him, that's when you're going to know exactly what to do and you won't give up. Yeah. That's so good. G that, that, that part about trusting in God like can sound like such a romantic, easy, like, yeah, of course, you know, we've got songs that talk about, we trust in God. But I think the actual act of really surrendering and letting go, I've talked about it before, it's such a wonderful thing that that will free you and make you feel light, but it can sometimes be the hardest thing. I mean, you can sit there if you're having financial pressures and you can look at all the scriptures where God's talking about, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and you know all these things that God's going to provide for you. But to actually just go like, hey, do you believe it or not? Because what you talked about, how much we want certainty, is such a common human thing. We want, you know, yes, I can trust in God when I have, you know, four new big, big projects for my business lined up, or I've got that big promotion, or I've got that bonus coming that I know. Oh yeah, God is good. It's so that's look at that point. Yeah, well, you trust in God, right? When you have no opportunities in exactly. front of you, and you just got fired, right? And you're sitting there going, "What do I do?" That that is true. It's like, well. What he said is still true, and he's going to work in a way. I actually love, there's a man that we that's in Mighty Men with us, and he references the day, his name's Tanner, he's in my tribe, and, and he references the day that he got fired from his job as the best day in his life yeah. because he had to trust God, and he took a complete, like, bold step of faith, and it worked out way better than it ever would have. And I just, I, I've not heard many people describe like, getting that. fired as one of the best days in their life, and I just love that he does that. Well, I've not met, I've met other people that have said that, I've not met anyone that doesn't have like a drive and a determination for greatness yeah. that said that getting fired was the best yeah. day of your life. <laughs> Very good distinguishing point, G. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, because there is there is a, a point of like knowing when you're trusting God and when you're just being foolish, right? It, if you're trusting God means you're just going to lay around and wait for it to come knocking on the door and somebody to drop a sack of money, I would go ahead and say that you're ignoring a lot of other scriptures. <laughs> so you, there's some wisdom in here as well. Anything you want to add to that, G? No, I think that's great. It's just... Um, just to recap, yeah. right? The the whole point of this is for us to have great follow through, because you'll never see the per you'll never see the purpose of what God's bringing you through if you quit in the middle, and so it starts with having long suffering, which is a fruit of the spirit. Mm-hmm. I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but that's fruit of the spirit, meaning like God will provide these things in you when you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. It's such an important, but it's not the one that anyone likes to no. you know <laughs> focus on. But patience is one of those painful fruits of yeah. the spirit that really helps us bear fruit in the way that God wants us to. Then we've got to have eternal perspective, right? You've got to see your life through a larger lens. Look towards the end. Look into eternity, and you'll it'll allow you to make diff- different uh, decisions in the difficult circumstances that you're going through. And then lastly, you've got to rely on God. If you rely on yourself, you will short circuit uh, what what's supposed to be happening in this long suffering eternal perspective process by relying on God. That's where, you, where you're going to live uh, a life of great stewardship. That's where you're going to live a life that's accountable to him instead of trying to be accountable to man.